All right, if you will turn to 1 Samuel 4, we're going to start right there and get started on this stuff. Now, I thought about this young boy. He was about, he was about eight years old. He was at the corner of a mom and pop grocery store. And he was picking out a, some items there, and uh, he got a big old box of laundry detergent. And the grocery guy walked over there, the old man walked over there and said, Son, you're going to be doing laundry? And he said, No, I'm fixing to wash my dog. And he said, You're going to wash your dog with laundry detergent? And he said, Yeah. And the old man said, Well, now that might kill that dog. He said, You don't want to put that laundry detergent on that dog, it could kill it because that stuff's pretty strong. Well, the little boy wouldn't listen. He went ahead and bought the laundry detergent and uh, took, it, took it on home. And, and uh, he would, couldn't be stopped. He was going to be bound determined to do it. So about a week later, the little boy came back in the store, and the old man, the grocery man said, Hey, uh, how'd that detergent work out with your dog? How's your dog doing? And he said, Well, my dog is dead. He said, The dog died. And the grocer, he, he wasn't trying to be a guy that said, I told you so, but he said, Well, I'm sorry about that. He said, But I was kind of warning you about that detergent. It could kill that dog. And he said, I was kind of worried about that. You washed your dog in there, and the little boy said, Well, I don't think it was the detergent that killed him. And the old man said, you don't think it was? He goes, no, I think it was the spin cycle. <laughs> so I would say he failed the test on how to wash his dog. Now, we go through life all the time, and God puts things in our lives so we will be tested, and that's just normal. God tested Abraham. He didn't tempt him. Now, there's a difference between being tempted, and the Bible says God doesn't tempt any man with evil. That's not what it's talking about. But he tests us at different times. If you go back and look at Abraham... When Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, when he drew it out, and God said this, now that I know your heart, basically he knew his, he wanted to know his heart. And you, you say, well, God knows everything. There are things that God does know, but I think there are things that he wants to prove in us to prove to ourselves, not only to him, but to us, about what we can do and how we would serve God. So there are tests to be taken in this life, and we're going to have to go through some of those. So we go to 1 Samuel 4. We're going to start in verse 4. And while you're turning there, let me tell you what's happened. Uh, on, this, on this passage, the first four verses. Israel is fighting the Philistines. The Philistines went to war with them, and they lose, Israel loses 4,000 men. So they get back to camp, and they say, you know, we know why we're losing this war, because we don't have the, the Ark of the Covenant. It represented the presence of God. And we don't have the presence of God with us, so let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. So this is what happens in verse 4. The people went to Shiloh that they might, that they might bring him the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, of hosts who dwells between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. We're going to talk about those two cats here in just a minute. And he said, When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all the Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, and they said, What does this sound, this great shout in the camp and the, the Hebrews mean? They understood that the Ark of the Lord had come into camp. And so the Philistines were afraid, and they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Now, I want you to notice what these guys are saying. Gods are in, in small letters. They weren't considering God, our God, God Jehovah. They were considering they were just a bunch of gods they thought they were following. They didn't understand it yet. It says here in verse 9, Be strong, conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you not become servants of the Hebrews, that they see you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. And so the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Now, let's talk about this just a minute. Here's what happens in this passage of Scripture. They don't have the presence of God with them. The Bible said we were either hot or cold, not lukewarm. But what they did is they put on a front like they had God in their lives. You see, for us, we have to know something. If, if in our lives we look at God and use Him for a crutch or maybe something to get an advantage of, He's not happy with that. He wants the relationship with you and I that doesn't matter what goes on. We know that He's in us, we're in Him, and whatever we ask of Him, we know He'll do that. That's what the Word tells us that we can do. But because they brought the Ark of the Covenant, they lost 4,000 men when God wasn't even around. But when they brought the Ark in and they lost 30,000 men, there was a problem. So what was the problem? Well, I'll tell you what the problem was. Eli was the priest. He's the guy, if you remember, raised Samuel. Samuel went into Eli's quarters and they raised him. Hannah had him as a baby, brought him to Eli to bring him up in the tabernacle. 
But his two sons, Eli's two sons, were wicked. They were stealing the sacrifices from the people. When people would bring a sacrifice of meat or whatever, they would take part of it for themselves. They were crooks. They were thieves. But not only that, they were also sleeping with the young women at the, the tabernacle gate. They were seducing those women. So Eli had talked to his boys, but nothing changed. And so when this happened, when, this, when they lose this battle here, uh, they go back and these guys, these guys die. They were killed. So we know from this happening that God is not pleased when we're not passing tests. There's things that God puts in our lives that he wants us to be able to pass a test. Now, you know as well as I do, if you take your driver's test and you flunk that test, they're not just going to say, well, I'll tell you what, you just go ahead and drive all week, come back in a couple weeks, and you will take the test again. That's not the way it works. When we flunk a test, spiritually speaking, God is trying to get us into a position to be stronger. God wants us to be able to handle more and more, but he tests us in order to do that. The Bible talks about gold being tested as with fire. All the dross and all the impurities come to the top. Do you want to see what somebody's really made out of? Make them mad. Get upset. They will either curse you, they'll say something they shouldn't. She was talking about that a while ago up here. Very same thing. Something's going to come out. And I remember talking to two ladies in here one day, and they were sisters, and they were upset at one another. And I said, sis, you can't be upset at her like that. And she said, I said, there, there must be something in there. She goes, oh, yeah, there's hate down in here. And she brings it out. It was her fault. But I was trying to get her to see there's something there. God's trying to get us over this. So the Philistines, they capture this Ark of the Covenant. They, they take it to the house of Dagon. Now, here's, here's the crazy thing about this. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. Inside of the Ark were the Ten Commandments. Aaron's rod that budded, and the golden pot had manna in it. Those three things were in it. So it represented the presence of God. The next morning after they put this in the house of Dagon, Dagon falls down and falls in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And it was a representation of that no flesh can glory in his presence. That's what he was talking about. Because the Philistines were fleshly people. They had no spiritual, spiritual thing about them. Just the way they were. They'd done this two days in a row. They set it back up. The next night, same thing happened. Philistines then realized this couldn't stand up against the presence of God. Now, think about Dagon. Dagon was a, a god of fertility. He was half fish and half man. And so when you, if you look at what Jonah was doing, when, the, when he went to Nineveh, those, Nineveh, those guys also worshipped Dagon, half fish and half man. So how do you think God presented them? He goes and puts a man in the belly of a whale for three days and a fish spits him out on the, on the bank, and all of a sudden these people are thinking, okay, this must be of God. It's part of a fish. That's how Jonah began to minister to those Ninevites, and that's one of the reasons why they accepted what Jonah said. So they were also worshiping this God of fertility, Dagon. And they get to this point, so they put, they put this ark in there. But notice what the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world, the small things, what that means, and the things which are despised, God has chosen those things. Do you know that Christianity right now is despised? They hate us for everything. We can't do anything right. Uh, we're, we're hated. People don't like what the Christians are doing. But yet, we're still going on. The things which are not, they want to bring the things which are. So the, the word I want to get to is verse 29. Notice this part of it, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God will not allow you to walk in the flesh and his presence and his spirit be able to lead you. There's a fight going on in your, in your body for the spirit to lead and the flesh to do what it wants to do. And it's a constant battle. Paul said, I die daily. I've got to kill myself every day. We want to in the flesh do what we want to do, but it doesn't work that way. God's not allow, going to allow you to move up till you pass the test. That driving test we're talking about, you first have to take a regular test. Then once you get your test taken and you pass your driver's test, then you can set for another test at your CDLs. Then once you get your CDLs, then you can even move up in that, class B, class A, whatever. You can move up. But you have to pass the test, and as you get to a place spiritually in God, He wants you to get stronger and to be able to do more things and deal with more situations because God's put us here to help people. That's why we're here. It's not what we can do. It's not all about us, what I can do. It's not about me being up here. I believe I help more people outside the church than I do here as far as just speaking or whatever because that's what God's taken us. He's taken us places where people need help. 
We're supposed to go help people and minister to them. But how can we do that if we're walking in the flesh all the time? Because, well, you know what's going to do? It's like you said a while ago, Lord, send me. Even though I'm not willing, even though I don't want to, Lord, send me anyway. Push my flesh out of the way and let my spirit begin to lead us and guide us. That's where we're headed. I thought about when we were in high school. I'll never forget this. We, were, we had a wrestling coach, and we hated him, and he hated us. I didn't wrestle. I played basketball. So he didn't like basketball players. So what he did was he was always giving us a hard time saying mouthy stuff too, and, and we, would, we would mouth off to him too at times and get busted. But anyway, so <laughs> one day he has a test. and he, I forgot what he was teaching even. I, I don't remember what he was teaching, but we, it was going to be a surprise test. Well, the first hour found out about it, and we had a couple of smart girls in there. Girls are usually smarter than guys in school. You all know that, right? So anyway, uh, so these girls get these answers, and so I'm like in fourth hour. And so uh, they give us all these answers to the test. So what we did is we put the, they stuck the answers to the front of the desk where he couldn't see it, but we had all the answers. It was like a 20-question test. And so we, and here's what's crazy. Everybody that's in the front, they copied all the answers, and as soon as you got through with your test, you could leave. So they get through, they hand their test in, everybody moves up. Now, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed because he didn't figure it out for a while. But after everybody, and I was on one of the, like the third or fourth row, I was already gone. And all of a sudden, the guys come to me and say, hey, guess what? What? We all got an F in that class. He found those answers on the front of the, on, on the, front of the desk, and so we all got Fs. And so he gave everybody an F in every class and made us retake the test again. It was a different test. We knew the answers to that one. But I said all that to say this. You know, you're going to have to pass tests. And there's going to be time in our lives that God puts us in a position and he wants to check your heart. Where's your heart? What do you want to do this? Are you going to treat somebody the way you should or are you going to treat them like you want to treat them? You see, it's important for us to love people. We need to be kind to people and courteous. We need to forgive people when, they're, when they've wronged us. Let's forgive them and move on. Bitterness can't be a part of our spiritual man because that's what the flesh craves. Do you remember the flesh being, there's three parts, there's body, soul, and spirit. Your spirit's been reborn. It's been saved once you brought it into the kingdom of God. But we talked about this a lot. Your soul has not. Your soul is your mind, your emotions, your feelings, all those things that come inside of you, and that controls the flesh. And so you've got a three, part, three parts of who we are. We've got a spirit, we've got a soul, and we've got a body. Our spirit, being born again, knows this is the direction we need to go. But our flesh sometimes, the way we feel in our emotions are taken in another direction because I just don't feel like doing that. I know the Bible says I should love people and bless those that curse me and pray for those that despitefully use me. But God, I would just rather see them hit by an 18-wheeler. And I'll do it if you'll just put them in the road. I'll be the one driving the truck. Let me do it, God. And then I'll repent and then I'll get back with you and it'll all be good. But that's not the way God wants us to do it we got to have the Spirit of God live in us because we can't let the flesh overrun that. Now, what happens is we get back to our story. Dagon's fallen before the presence of God. And so the great plague starts hitting the Philistines. All of a sudden, now they start having these people are dying by the droves. And they're having, let's check this out, verse, 1 Samuel 5, verse 6. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them. A bunch of them died here. And he smote them. With emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. Now, if you go back and look what most theologians believe this word came from, some of them believe tumors. Some believe they're hemorrhoids. Yes, I said that. <laughs> How many of you don't know what a hemorrhoid is? Ask your mom and dad. I don't know what to tell you. Ask your wife if you <laughs> But think about this just a minute. I always figured it was hemorrhoids. That's just what I, I've read. I've studied it. I mean, that's just what it was. So they're all dying and having hemorrhoids. I mean, what a great nation to have. <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant. What's your, <laughs> who's your mascot? We got a big hemorrhoid. You know, what they, you know what they did? They went and built golden hemorrhoids. They did. They built them out of gold. Now, I, I don't know whose hemorrhoids they were looking at, but somebody. <laughs> but anyway, they, they built <laughs> They say, we got to get rid of these things. These, these things are going wrong. So, so they make a big offering. They say, we got to send this Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. He's killing us. So they, they build five <laughs> golden hemorrhoids. They do, you got to read it. They build them, and they send them back, and they send five golden mice with them to get rid of, this, to get rid of all this stuff. And so what they did is they took, 
two cows that had newborn babies, and they put this uh, Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And so they got these newborn babies, and they said, listen, if these cows will not go into Israel, but if they turn around and come back to these calves, we'll know that it's just part of what we've had to deal with. But if those cows leave these newborn babies and walk into Israel, we'll know it has to be God because that won't be natural. It won't be a fleshly thing. It's got to be a spiritual thing. And so they did. That's what they did. They sent them there, and, and they got rid of them. Now, when that gets to Israel, there's these guys in the wheat field, and they see the Ark of the Covenant coming, and, and they all start rejoicing, and they start praising the Lord. But the problem was, look what it says here in 1 Samuel 6 and 19. But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. And the, or, the people mourned greatly because the Lord, what he had done. Now, you say, okay, what happened here in this passage of Scripture? Well, Israel gets the Ark of the Covenant back, but they don't know how to deal with it. And so the blood was always put on the mercy seat there on the Ark of the Covenant. And when they took the lid off, you see, this is how God works. When you and I are born again, all he sees is the blood that was shed for our sins. He sees the blood of Christ on us. That's what God sees. But here's the problem with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, when you move the lid where the blood was applied, it removed the blood, and judgment was poured out on those 70 men. You see, he couldn't see the blood any longer. When they took it off the Ark of the Covenant, all he could see was the law, the Ten Commandments. And so he knew what he had to do. So God killed 70 men because they took the blood or the covering off the Ark. You and I need to remember something. The blood is everything for us. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that causes us to be who we are. The Bible says it's the, it's the cross. It's the, it's the foolishness of the cross that gives us power. To us that believe it's power. And so we have to understand that part of it. So these men, uh, they had to take in the mercy seat. They'd taken all the blood off of that. Now let's go on here. Let's go to 2 Samuel 6. The Ark of the Covenant is back in Israel. David has been anointed king. And so he, he gets the guys together and says, you know what, we need to get together and we need to get the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And so they start with this, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. David and all of his house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, on fir wood, on harps, stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put his hand handle to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. The anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and God struck him there for his error and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah and he called the name of that place Perez Uzzah to this day. Now, he failed the test and God struck him down. You say, why would God do something like that? Well, there's symbolizations all through the Bible of things that happen. Here is a man who is of the flesh trying to handle the presence of God in the flesh. It don't work that way. You cannot handle the presence of God in the flesh. It just won't work. This man died trying to handle it. Here's the key behind that. Number one, David did not know what he was doing. Just because the Philistines sent the Ark of the Covenant with two cows on a cart... I guess he thought it was the same way. But he had to go back and look and see what happened. The priests were the ones who actually carried the spirit and the presence of God in the ark. So you and I have been made priests. The Bible talks about that. We've been heirs and joint heirs. We're priests with God. We have the ability to carry the, the presence of God in our lives. But we can't do it fleshly. It just don't work that way. And so here we find out that the presence of God here, trying to handle it, cost him his life. You know, I'm, I'm, the Bible says I'm crucified, Galatians 2.20 says I'm crucified with Christ, but yet I live. And it talks about, but it's not me, it's Christ that lives in me. But he said the life that I live in the flesh is done by the faith of God. In other words, I can't live this life in the flesh without having the presence of God in my life. The Word of God has to be changing me all the time. When we read this Bible, it ought to be reading us. This is what we need to be. This is who we are. You've been born again. You've been made heirs and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. I told you last week, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's such a true statement. We have the power over the devil. When the devil uh, was defeated, when Jesus rose again on the third day, all the power was given back to me and you. We have the ability to trample on serpents and scorpions in the spiritual sense. 
We've been given that ability. So we shouldn't worry about all that. But in order for us to do that, we have to be spiritually minded and we've got to walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. Amen. And that's where people struggle. You know, if your life is a mess and you're struggling with things and you, uh, let's say you're, you're all out, you're out of whack, whether it be in your, your life, your money, it may, whether your kids are crazy, it doesn't matter. You can't help some of that stuff. But how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Do you do it out of the, the, if God would do it or how Jesus would handle it or do we go ballistic and do things we shouldn't do? We have to remember something. If we wear the wristband, what would Jesus do? Then what would he do? How would he handle it? How would you handle a woman at the well? How would you handle a woman caught in adultery? Would you say, let's throw rocks at her, let's get her out of here, she's not with us, she needs to go somewhere else? How do you handle people that don't look like we do or maybe smell like we do? How, how do we talk to them? How are we representing them? The other day I, I felt so bad. I was coming uh, to work and I was uh, done some stuff and I was coming this direction and, and I saw a young man and he was walking on the highway, on the side of the highway and it was snowing and he had a huge bottle of whiskey in his hand. And he was walking and he fell down one time and fell down another time. And, and, and God spoke to me and said, pick that guy up and, and take him where it was cold. Take him where he needs to be. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm behind. i got to get this building done. I was so calm, you know, working, getting, trying to get out this done, trying to get it done. And I took off out there and I hadn't no more got there than, than uh, Shane calls and says, this guy's on their porch. <laughs> and I'm driving down there and I'm, pre I'm preaching this message. I've been planning on it. And God said, there's your spiritual mind, son, right there. Didn't have time for somebody that needed it, but you were so engulfed in trying to take care of the kingdom that you forgot about the people in the kingdom. I turned around, went down there, picked him up, and I knew who he was. And he was just lost. And when I pulled up there, he called me by name, and I called him by name, and I said, get in, man. I didn't know that was him on the road. I might have stopped, but that wasn't the point. God had told me, to stop and pick that guy up. And I thought, I'm in a hurry. He's drunk. I don't want to mess with the drunk today. I'm, i got stuff to do. That wasn't what God wanted me to do. So I picked him up. I took him home. I let him out. I prayed with him. And uh, prayed with his dad just not too long ago. I went up there and prayed with his dad. And he said, whatever you do, don't tell my dad. My dad's asleep in there. And he said, I don't want my dad to be mad at me. He said, I'm not doing what I need to be doing. And he said, I'm just, but he said, I'm so cold. And he said, can you turn your heater on? And I turned on the vents, and he was warming his hands, and hands were cold. It broke my heart. I thought, you know, we bypass people every day that need Jesus. And we're so busy doing kingdom stuff, we forget about the people in the kingdom or the people that need the kingdom. And we've got to be more spiritually minded. And I thought, God, help me to always be thoughtful of those people that need it. You know, I've seen so many good men that have lost their way somewhere along the way. They've lost their way. Pastors and preachers who fall into to fleshly desires. I was talking to a guy the other day, and I didn't know this man. Uh, I said something about it. He was a guy that had done a lot of uh, he done a lot of conferences, and I went to these conferences and I spoke to him, and I, I made the, I asked the statement. I or I asked him. I said, "Hey, have you have you heard from this guy lately?" And he goes, "Have you not heard?" And I said, "No, I haven't heard. What's going on?" He said, "He's had multiple affairs, and his church is being had ran three thousand people." And his church is falling apart. And they tried to get the associate in there, but he's ruined so much stuff, and he was having affairs with different women in the church. And it just exploded the church. And I, it just broke my heart. And I thought, what happened? Somewhere down the line, the flesh took over. And the spirit was pushed aside. And because of that, he made some bad choices. we got to remember, the devil, the word said the thief come to do three things. What? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said in that same passage in John 10, 10, I came to give you life and to give that more abundantly. We've got to always, we've got to pass a test, guys. When it comes to it, you better think about the decision you're fixing to make because there's going to be a test you're going to have to pass. And the devil's going to put stuff in front of you and say, how about this? And we've got to be able to pass those tests. But I love what this last passage of Scripture, you know, we can't give away to flesh the desires. Now let me say this about the building. We can't, we got a new building we're fixing to have an open house on here in a little bit. Let's don't get caught up in the building. It's not about the building. Somebody say amen on that one. Amen. God has given us the provision to build a building. And eventually we're going to build a new sanctuary too and make this out of office spaces in here. But until we do that, we continue to want the presence of God in this place. So the building out there is not necessarily the greatest thing out there. What's going to be great out there is young high school kids 
feeling the presence of God in that sanctuary out there. That's what we want. We want them to be brought in for a reason. Yes, we're going to use them. You don't, you know, you don't go fishing with an empty hook, do you? No, you put something on that hook to bait them in. Well, we're doing the same thing. We're going to get them out here. Maybe they'll find Jesus and their lives will be changed. That's the whole idea behind the building. It's not the building. It's what's what goes on inside the building. It's like this building here. It's not what goes on the outside. What's on the inside? No, we can dress it up and look good and whatever we do, put makeup on if we're ladies. You know, guys wouldn't be making makeup. I'm just telling you right up front. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon. But anyway, we, we put on this out here, but what's on the inside is what counts. And so we look at this last passage of Scripture in 2 Samuel 6 and 9. David was afraid of the Lord. He was scared. He didn't know what to do. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? See, he didn't know how it was supposed to be presented, how it was supposed to be brought. So the ark of the Lord, notice this, remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And notice right here, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told to King David, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. Because of what? Because they understood the presence of God, how important it was, and they kept it inside of a place that was safe. So David went and brought the ark of the God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Now, here's about Obed-Edom. Let's talk about him a minute. Here's a man who passed the test. They said, can we leave this, the ark of the covenant in your house? What did he do? He said, yes, you can leave it. We want you to leave it. So the presence of God was left in his house. And because of that, his house was blessed and everything in it. Not only was it blessed, people saw that he was blessed. People saw that there was something going on in his life. When you and I have the presence of God in this house right here, this tabernacle not made by hands, but when the presence of God abides in here, things are going to happen around you. And people are going to see it. All the time. They're going to see it. If, they're going to know if you're blessed. I've seen people in my life, pastors that I know for years, have been faithful to their ministries, and God has blessed them in that. And they've, they've, they've just abounded in grace, and they've got, they've got a lot of wisdom. There's just a lot of things going on. They've got it going on because God has blessed them. It's because they've been faithful. They've passed some tests. Have we ever failed tests? You bet. We fail them a lot. Peter failed. Peter failed. And, 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 but people have failed in it. But that doesn't mean it's over just because we fail. We, we have to pick ourselves up and say, Lord, let me take this test again. Let me try this again. I want to prove to you how important it is for your presence to abide in me that I become victorious over the stuff that's trying to make me stumble. I want to be victorious over the serpents and scorpions, spiritually speaking. I remember we had to cast out some, uh, there's a young man coming to church here. It's been quite a few years back. And he was out here howling at the moon on the top of his car. And I got a call and said, this kid's out here. So I come out here and he's here. And we bring him in and he starts trying to bite us. And he starts spitting at us. And he started cursing us and using an F-bomb and told me. And we started praying with him. And he looked up. I remember he was in the floor right here. We put him in the floor. He was super stout, strong. Man, he was strong. But he was possessed. And he looked up at me and he said, F-bomb, you Max Ford. And I looked at him and smiled and I said, at least you know who I am. Because so does God and we're fixing to cast you out of this boy. And he come out of there screaming and hollering. When, he's, when he came out, he's, he's screaming about his shoulders. He said, my shoulders are killing me. And I thought about the scripture. The Bible says when the demons came out of him, it rent him sore. But we, we, God, we prayed and, and those things, we got them stuff, that stuff out of him there. I don't know how many was in there, but they come out of here. But you know, I thought about those those scriptures, and it's crazy. The time I'd been fasting for like that week, I'd been the week before I'd been fasting for like seven days. I'd fasted for seven days. And I remember the scripture when it talks about Jesus said, This only comes forth by prayer and fasting. And it was a time when God knew I was going to need it because we come in here. I wasn't afraid of those serpents and scorpions. I thought, you know what, you're coming out of this boy. And I'll never forget it. I had some of my elders here. We were praying over, there's about four or five of us. And that kid got delivered that night and got up and walked out of here in his right mind. It wasn't a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight, but I tell you, there's power in the presence of God. And when you've got the presence of God in your life and you're praying and doing what you need to do, there ain't nothing God won't do for you. Now, God still loves us. You say, well, I got some flaws. God loves me. God does love you. But there's a thing called sanctification, too. We have a sanctification process that we go through. We should be getting better all the time. 
not because our works are going to get us into heaven, but we, if we're going to be closer to God, then we need to act more closer like God does. So it's important that the presence of God live in our life. Now here's the key behind all this. I'm going to close right here. When the presence of God abides in this house and you let him have free reign, then and only then will you reach your full potential. Now you may be saved and going to heaven and God loves us and all that, and that's fine. But are you reaching your full potential? God will not allow or put you in a position your character won't hold you in. He will not. He can't put you in a position if your character is not going to hold it. So we have to make sure that we pass a few tests. The Bible says lay no hands on no man suddenly. You can't just grab somebody and <clears throat> put them in position just because they're here and hope it works out. I've made that mistake before. Put them in position because they're here. They're a pretty good guy. Seems like a good guy. Seems like a good girl. Let's put them in this position and you get bit. You know why? Because they weren't ready and we didn't use wisdom. So God has to give us wisdom in doing all this. You want the anointing in your life? Then you let the Spirit of God work through your life. It's that simple. How bad do you want it? Say, well, I don't. I think we all just have the same, same anointing. I'll never forget what an old preacher said one time. He'd been in the ministry 50 years. He said, you think, you think you're going to have the same level of anointing I had? And I've laid in the floor for 50 years praying and fasting and giving my life to God. You think your anointing is going to be the same as mine 50 years later? He said, if that's the case, God would be a respect to persons. And he's no respect to persons. There's growth that we have to go through. We're not just there overnight. A young Christian, the Bible talks about the milk of the word. It talks about people growing. And we see that with John Mark. When, when Paul and Barnabas, they were so at odds that they, they had to go two different directions. The Bible said they were so... It was so sharp, the contention between them was that they had to leave, separate from each other. And it's because John Mark, Mark basically, had left him in some other place. And so Paul didn't want to take him with him. Said, He's, he can't do it. He left us. I don't trust him. But Barnabas took him and began to take him under his wing, began to minister to him. Paul took Silas and they went another direction. And in the end, you see Paul telling Timothy this, Hey, send John Mark to me. For he's good for me. What happened? One, Paul probably softened a little, but number two, Mark probably grew a little. Because all of a sudden Paul saw he was good for he was useful for the ministry. So we all grow, but there's tests to be taken. We're going to pass some tests. But as long as we let the presence of God lead us and guide us and the word work through us, and we have the fruit of the Spirit, it'll work. Because ain't nothing greater than love. You love people, that's what Jesus did for us. That's what God did for us. So you got to remember that. If you want to walk in the Spirit, you can't fulfill it. You won't fulfill the less of the flesh. But you got to walk in it. you got to let God live through you. That's what you want to do. I want you to bow your heads this morning.